Yeah, I'm I'm calling it the devil and Joe Biden, but I'm I'm not saying that the president of the United States made an actual deal with the actual devil. It's more of a metaphor. I hope I'm I'm really just asking questions. In the classic short story by Stephen Vincent Benet, The Devil and Daniel Webster, Daniel Webster was the hero of the story. He defended a New Hampshire farmer against a personage who called himself Mr. Scratch. The farmer had signed a deal with Scratch for seven years of prosperity in exchange for his soul. At the end of those seven years, the devil demanded his due. The farmer called on the amazing Daniel Webster to be his advocate in the battle for his soul. In his victory speech on November 7th, Joe Biden said, I sought this office to restore the soul of America. I'm not sure a president can rebuild the soul of America, but I hope Mr. Biden will lead us in that direction. If so, then like Benet's fictional version of Daniel Webster, the real Joe Biden will wind up being a hero in our story. But what if President Biden is not like the Daniel Webster of Benet's story? What if he's more like the farmer? I'm not accusing our new president of making a deal with the real devil, but I wonder if metaphorically he has already made deals with many devils. Despite the present acrimony felt in the United States, almost all Americans agree that they want President Biden to succeed in certain areas. Most of us want the president to be a successful commander-in-chief. That's because we want to live in peace and safety. And there is a near unanimous hope that the new president will succeed in fulfilling the oath he made as he entered office to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. But will he see the Constitution as his prime directive? Or has he already sold part of his soul when it comes to protecting with with all his might? the heart of the Constitution, the First Amendment. Richard Stingle served as a leader on Joe Biden's transition team. A month before joining that team, he wrote a Washington Post op-ed called Why America Needs a Hate Speech Law. He called for massive restrictions to the First Amendment right of free speech, and that, friends, is a deal with a dreadful devil. That's how dictators totalitarians and fascists let you know that they have arrived. Stingel wrote that the First Amendment was engineered for a simpler era. He said all speech is not equal, and where truth cannot drive out lies, we must add new guardrails. He says guardrails, someone else might say prison bars. He says the truth, someone else might say fake news. He wants a law that will drive out lies. Think about that. Does it mean an academic who disagrees with the majority on a topic such as man-made climate change, and yes, such academics do exist, does he mean such a person would be silenced by the government? Does he mean that the United States would become a safe zone for the faint of mind, a place where dissent is silenced, where reasoning together and discussion can no longer be tolerated? Then Stengel quoted Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who spoke of the necessity of protecting free thought, not just free thought for those who agree with us, Holmes said, but freedom for the thought that we hate. Stingle said he's for protecting thought we hate, but not for protecting speech that incites hate. What a can of worms that opens. Think about how much of last year's Democratic National Convention would have been censored if the government consistently removed all the words that might incite hate. Not violence, mind you, just hate. Let me tell you, those speeches did not incite love toward Donald Trump or the Republicans. They made their political enemies sound as bad as they could. That's politics. And some of their words could be construed to incite actual violence. Remember when they talked about abortion rights? Some of us see abortion as the killing of a human being. If the human fetus is not human, 
then what species is she? Her DNA is human. Her heart is human. Her hands are human. Don't tell me she's something other than human. When a candidate endorses abortion rights, is he inciting violence against the most vulnerable of human beings? Do you see the problem? Nobody wants to tolerate hate speech until we hear the other side's definition of hate speech. Do you want guardrails, that is limits, on the freedom of speech? Who decides where to place those guardrails? Who decides what is, in fact, an incitement of hate? Government officials, bureaucrats, liberal academics? The mainstream media lets the Southern Poverty Law Center decide for them which organizations should be designated as hate groups. But to many of us, the SPLC looks like an anti-Christian hate group. Think of the problems created by a law prohibiting speech that incites hate. First of all, almost all political speech has the potential, at least, to incite hate. And then there are legitimate differences of opinion. To my mind, one of the most benign and loving songs ever written would be a children's Sunday school song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, For the Bible Tells Me So. But to some elites, those are fighting words. They see the Bible as loaded with hate speech. By its very nature, freedom of speech includes difficult things. It allows people the freedom to be wrong, the freedom to be right when everyone else is wrong, the freedom to speak out against thought fashions of a particular time and place, the freedom to stand against the status quo, the freedom to form your own opinions and express them. That's why it's so unsettling when we see the military moving toward ideological purity tests, tests that apparently check for conformity to the new liberalism of identity politics and political correctness. As George Orwell made so clear, speech police soon become thought police. Will Joe Biden preserve, protect, and defend the freedom of speech? His choice of Richard Stengel for his transition team does not look good for the United States Constitution or the rule of law. In fact, many of his choices for key positions on the transition team and for posts in his administration did not bode well for liberty. But I remain cautiously optimistic about our country in the near term. I believe the Constitution, passed down to us by our forebears, has strength in it yet. But we must understand that said Constitution is under fire from all sides and will only protect us if we remain committed to it. I could go on and on about areas where the Biden administration has shown that it might not be as committed as it should be, to preserving, protecting, and defending the Constitution of the United States. I might mention the first right enumerated in our Bill of Rights, the freedom of religion. That's under attack today in ways I never could have believed. We might talk about protecting the Second Amendment. That's part of the Constitution, too. We could speak of Joe Biden's already compromised position, on the most dangerous nation in the world when it comes to foreign threats to the Constitution, Communist China. We could talk about the administration's virtual endorsement of defunding police, even as they have turned our nation's capital city into a virtual police state. We could go beyond the Constitution and look at issues where this administration seems to be siding with the real devil, particularly in his quest to utterly destroy young people. What does all this have to do with prophecy? A great deal, actually. And I hope we can talk about the specifics in the near future. But for now, consider this. At almost every turn, the Biden administration seems to be choosing a path forward that repeatedly conforms to the picture given in the Bible of planet Earth in the time leading up to Christ's return. It's natural to feel sorrow and concern when you see the nation you love in a downward spiral. That should spur all of us to be better citizens. 
working to fix what's wrong. It should also prompt followers of Christ to be ever more committed to Him in our thoughts and behavior, and especially in presenting the gospel to this generation. At the same time, we should never forget that we are not just citizens of earth, but also of heaven. So don't make heaven an afterthought. That's where we should focus our hopes, dreams, and purposes. Look for our next program the first week of March. To know when we put out a new program, subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on Facebook. God willing, I'll see you soon.